Good. And what a better episode to start our experiment with filming with than we have as our eighth guest of the Spillover podcast. Very honored to have you here, Dr. Yaron Brook from the Ayn Rand Institute. Great. Happy to be here. Yeah. Welcome. Thank uh, you. I guess, first off, uh, not a lot of people, especially here in Finland, they don't know. This is, these are ideas that we don't, don't get to hear here in Finland. Basically, not at all. This, yep. And uh, so maybe start out by explaining who is Ayn Rand, what is objectivism, and, well, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> who am I? <laughs> I'm, I'm just a, just a voice uh, re representing, uh, representing Ayn Rand. So, yeah, so let me start by who is Ayn Rand, and then we'll kind of circle back to right. who I am, because uh, <laughs> I think it'll be clearer once we know who Ayn Rand is. Yeah. I mean, Ayn Rand w was, uh, was born in, uh, in Russia in 1905 to a middle-class Jewish family. So she was born Alicia Rosenblum. Uh, and... She witnessed the Russian Revolution and, and its consequences. Uh, her, her father, who was a middle class uh, owner of a pharmacy, uh, the pharmacy was nationalized, taken away from him. There were part was taken away from him. Everything you've read about what happened uh, when the communists took over happened to Ayn Rand. And, and she, was, she was a teenager. But she was, re she even at that age rebelled against it, and it was clear to her that this was wrong, that this was uh, bad for her life, and, and she sought out the earliest opportunity to escape. And uh, there was a little window in the early 1920s, where you, or the late 1920s, where you could get out, um, and uh, you could get a visa to the United States and to go study or to go do research. And she took it, and she got out, and, you know, the visa was supposed to, she was supposed to go back, but everybody knew, her family knew, she would never go back, right? Yeah. She would yeah. never go, she knew, she was 22 years old, and she knew that if she stayed, she would be killed. Right. There was no question. She was an independent voice, she stood up for herself, and at university, that, w that was just unacceptable. Yeah. Uh, so she, she came to the United States with nothing, uh, with this idea that she wanted to become a writer. And particularly, she, she was very interested in, in movies. She had watched movies in, in Russia, and she'd fallen in love with American movies, and uh, she wanted to get into the movie business. So she shows up in Hollywood uh, one day uh, with, a, with a letter of introduction from a cousin in Chicago, and she goes into the studios of Cecil B. DeMille. I don't know if you know who Cecil B. DeMille was. Sounds very familiar, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. He, he, at the time, was the greatest <coughs> producer of movies, silent movies, right. uh, okay. and uh, a very famous Cecil B. DeMille Studios, and uh, he had his own studio company in those days. And, yeah. and and, uh, you know, they told her, don't call us, you know, we'll call you, kind of a brush off. Yeah. Yeah. And she's walking out of the studio, and there's a, there's a big convertible with Cecil B. DeMille sitting in the thing, driving by. And she's staring at him, this little Russian woman with these big eyes, and she's staring at him. So he stops the car, yeah. and he says, why are you staring? And she says, and she tells him the story of, you know, she grew up in Russia, and she admires his movies, and she can't believe she's meeting him. And he says, get in the car. He gets in the car, and he says, well, if you want to be in the movie business, you need to know how movies are made. And he takes it to the back lot where they're filming The King of Kings, the story of Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. And he says, here's a pass for a week to be an extra on the movie. And indeed, she's an extra. If you've, if you, there's a, there are screenshots where we can find her as an extra on the movie. And she lands up meeting her husband on, this, on the set. And she lands up, this is, lands up being the first job among many, many small little jobs that she has in Hollywood. She works in the wardrobe department. She works in all kinds of things. Basically building up her knowledge of English. And, and she's writing in the evenings and she's doing that. And she lands up writing a, a novel called We the Living, which describes life in the Soviet Union, um, which doesn't do well at all in the 1930s in yeah. America. Because in the 1930s in America, most intellectuals, Mm. Well, the sophisticated intellectuals are commies. Yeah. They're communists. So yeah. they, don't wanna, they don't want a book that describes the evil of communism. Yeah. Uh, we the Living is the most autobiographical book of all her novels. Was the book any good, though? Or was it it's, well written? It's if she I think it's very well written. And it's, 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 I think everybody should read it. It's, yeah. a, it's one, of the great, one of the greatest indictments of what communism is really about. So not on a mass scale in terms of the slaughter of millions of people, yeah. as, as you would read in a history book, but what it does to the human soul, what it does to the human spirit, how it destroys the best within us. The, the, you know, so it destroys ambition, it destroys achievement, it destroys 
rational decision making. Basically, it 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 relegates the human the human being to doing what they're told to to authority. Right. right. Yeah. So so communism and all authoritarianism, because the book is ultimately an anti-authoritarian book, is is an is an it's a book against the idea of authoritarianism and collectivism and you as an individual is just a mindless brute, which, yeah. is, which is the way authoritarian regimes always treat the individual. But what's interesting about the novel, one of the interesting things about it, is in the 1940s in Italy, w uh, during Mussolini's reign, uh, an Italian director decided to make a movie of We the Living. And uh, didn't get permission from Ayn Rand, just went ahead and made it uh, in fascist Italy. And Mussolini didn't mind because he thought it would be an anti-communist movie. So he let the movie go. He let the movie be made, and the movie was made, and uh, it opened in 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 Italy. And suddenly, and I think Mussolini got a copy, and he sent it to Goebbels uh, in in Nazi Germany. Now, and Goebbels watches the movie and immediately calls up Mussolini and says, you're crazy. This movie isn't anti-communist. Yeah. This movie is anti-authoritarianism. Yeah. You've got to stop it. So they collect all the copies of the movie and they burn them yeah. right? under Mussolini's orders and yeah. Goebbels' orders. Turns out one copy was saved. And it was discovered in the 1960s. And Ayn Rand got to watch it. And uh, they they made subtitles to it, and you today can get it. I think it's on Netflix, but it's okay. you can get the DVDs of it. And I think it just came out on Blu-ray, okay. and it's fabulous. It's 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 one of the top directors in Italy at the time. Yeah. It's filmed in a wonderful you know uh, Italian style. It's got Anita Valley, who's this amazingly beautiful Italian actress, plays the lead role, and it. It, it depicts what life was like for a young woman growing up uh, when communism came into being mm -hmm. and how, again, it destroys the human soul. So if you don't want to read the novel, at least watch the movie. And the movie's excellent. The movie's excellent. Whereas other Ayn Rand novels turned into movies are not great. This one's a great no. movie. Okay. All right. Anyway, so she makes Sweet a Living, and it does okay. Uh, but it doesn't do great uh, because, because the, the critics are, are so leftist. Um, then she writes, uh, she writes uh, a, a play that does well on Broadway and does well. So she kind of is making it in Hollywood. She writes screenplays. Ultimately, she writes a little novelette called Anthem. Can't get published in the United States, but gets published in Britain because it's, it's, a, it's a, a dystopian little book. And, and the British like dystopian, like think 84 and Animal Farm. Well, Anthem comes out just a little before 1984. And there's good reason to believe that George Orwell read Anthem yeah. before he wrote 1984. And that it impacted kind of. But, but Anthem, in my view, is much better than 1984 because it actually shows the way out of the dystopian future of the, yeah. of the evil 1984 future. Whereas is basically just description, right? Yeah. It, well, and, and the ending is just, okay, this bleak. is it. It, right. it. It's bleak. It's yeah. like there's nothing, nothing good comes of yeah. it. Right. So then she writes a book called uh, The Fountainhead, which is published in 1945. Twelve publishers reject it, mm. right? And then finally the 13th publisher accepts the book. They publish a small quantity because they don't think it'll do, be, it, do any well. It sells word of mouth. Mm. It sells immediately all the copies, and it becomes an instant bestseller. And to this day, The Fountainhead is one of the best-selling books um, ever. It sold millions of copies, and, okay. and it still sells about 100,000 copies a year yeah. to this day. Uh, that was 1945. 1957, she, she publishes a magnus opus, Atlas Shrugged. Um, Atlas Shrugged now, because of the Fountainhead success, publishes bid for it. Uh, they compete to publish it. It's published. It's an instant bestseller. And again, to this day, it, pu it, 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 it sells hundreds of thousands of copies. Isn't that the most uh, well-known book, though, of Ayn Rand? It's a well-known book. book. Today, it's her most well-known book. It used to be The Fountainhead. Both are very well-known. Yeah. Uh, in the United States, both uh, sell very well. Uh, Am I correct in saying it's the second highest selling book ever s no, behind no. the Bible? Behind the no, Bible. That, that's, that's not true. That's I mean, true. Okay. if, if yeah. I don't know, uh, 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 Tom Clancy or some best selling author right. publishes <laughs> a book, <laughs> that, that, that sells <laughs> many more books. That's millions of books. Yeah. You know, yeah. if you sell a little romance novel or, yeah. or, or, or a thriller. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, what you're referring to is a survey that was done in the early 1990s. Okay. Uh, where I think uh, uh, CEOs of, of large companies were asked what was the most influential book in their lives, and it came number two after the Bible. Okay, that but be, yeah. it's not it's, it's not, not the kind of thing I like to cite yeah. because 
uh, you know, you, you guys in finance or studying economics or whatever, you, 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 statistics, um, uh, it's easy to lie using statistics. So the survey Absolutely. is meaningless. Why is it meaningless? Because they, let's say they surveyed 100 people. Yeah. Well, 85 of them said the Bible. Yeah. Five said Atlas Shrugged. And then one or two said other books. Right. But 85 versus five, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's the second most influential, but it's 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 not a meaningful number. Now, I will say that Atlas Shrugged, if you did survey today, um, the the top successful entrepreneurs and business leaders and finance guys in the United States, I think you'd find that almost all of them have read Atlas Shrugged. I think you'd always also find that almost all of them will say it influenced their lives positively, that it had a significant impact on why they are successful. So it's an incredibly powerful incredible meaningful book to most i'd say most successful mm-hmm. businessmen entrepreneurs if you go to silicon valley everybody's read atlas shrugged if you go to wall street everybody's read atlas shrugged if you go to fortune 500 industrial companies everybody's read atlas shrugged mm-hmm. uh, you know it's it's not an accident that in the trump cabinet uh the businessmen in the cu- cabinet uh, all say atlas shrugged is their favorite book because uh, it's had a profound impact on business it should be read by every business student every economic student it should be in the curriculum of every business school uh, in the country it's it's in the curriculum of some business schools in the u.s but not everyone but but because we'll get to why it's controversial but because it's so controversial it, most business school excluded most universities excluded anyway after she published uh alice shrugged i then spent the rest of her life from 1957 until 1982 when she died uh, writing nonfiction, writing philosophical essays, writing about the world, and really in Atlas Shrugged, and to some extent in the Fountainhead, but in Atlas Shrugged very explicitly, and then later in her essays, she developed her own philosophy. She discovered a philosophical system. Called, she called it objectivism. And uh, it, so uh, she is both a, a, a novelist and a philosopher. Objectivism is a very original, I think profound, incredibly important philosophical uh, system uh, that really has something to say about almost every philosophical question that has been raised over the over the centuries. She's one of the very few philosophers in human history who's really developed a, a comprehensive system, not just, you know, uh, like, like John Locke is famous about his uh, political philosophy. Or some people are famous in epistemology, but she's famous in a kind of uh, in terms of presenting a comprehensive philosophical system but it's very controversial because it upends um, a lot of the philosophical teachings of of the last 200 years it is much more in the tradition of greek philosophy than it is in the tradition of much of western philosophy Continental uh, philosophy Kant and well, well she would yeah. definitely she she is she would yeah. definitely uh, is the yeah. enemy right. of continental philosophy she rejects yeah. um, y- you know she views German Roma- German idealism German romantic philosophy of of the late 18th century uh, and through the 19th century as the destroyer of the modern world as as the enemy of human life is is really yeah. bad um, she is much more figure in the tradition of the Enlightenment yeah. of, of the French and the Scottish Enlightenment. But even there, she challenges the, the Scottish Enlightenment, certainly on the issue of religion. She challenges the, the, um, the French and the rest of the Enlightenment on the issue of morality. She basically is upending the whole Judeo-Christian tradition in ethics and morality. And she's challenging the, the very nature of epistemology, the very nature of how we know. Uh, she challenges primarily, I'd say, the, the continental philosophy and how we know and in human knowledge. So in, in, in both ethics and her epistemology, she harkens back to Aristotle, but she's a, she's a much more developed yeah. version. So she would consider herself in an Aristotelian tradition. Yes, as opposed to the uh, the Platonian uh, um, tradition of, of having having leaders who uh, who interpret the world for you, and it's sort of a there's a parallel to to the um, to the Christian reform where Luther came and said you you have direct access to the Bible instead of uh, having these mediators. That's right, absolutely, and 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 and, and Luther definitely is a is an important force within Christianity or within Western civilization because he. He, he rejects the idea of authoritarian control over knowledge, yes. that the Pope has access to God and therefore has access to knowledge and truth, yeah. and we don't. But he says, no, every individual has. 
But you see, Luther is still saying that the truth comes right, from right. Revelation. Right. The truth comes from access to God and from Revelation from God. And it, Ayn Rand rejects that, as Aristotle did. So, yeah, I, Ayn Rand viewed, in a sense, so first of all, Ayn Rand viewed history as being shaped by ideas. So what, what really shapes the history of the world are the fundamental ideas, the ideas that, that the people, primarily intellectuals, hold in every, every epoch in history. Mm. And, and she views all of Western history as a battle between two philosophers, basically Plato and Aristotle. Are yeah. uh, uh, battling it out. Plato's vision of the world as uh, the philosopher king, the, the the philosopher really who has access to knowledge that's in a different plane, yeah. that the world of forms that only certain people have access to. They see the light. The rest of us live in a cave, and we only see shadows, and therefore we are completely dependent for knowledge, for truth, on the philosophers who access the light to access the world of forms. Yeah. And as a consequence, we need political leaders who are authoritarian, who tell us what to do, because what do we know? We're too stupid right. to actually know anything. Versus Aristotle, who says, no, human reason, rationality. E every human being has the faculty of reason. And as a consequence, every human being has, has access to the truth, mm. has access to reality. Therefore, every human being can guide his own life. He doesn't need the authority to guide it. And therefore, it's much more of an individualistic political system that leaves individuals to determine their own fate, to determine their own lives. Um, and if you think about this battle going on in Western civilization, you can really see it. Christianity, certainly in its early manifestation, is uh, in, in its, its Augustinian phase, if you will, is, is pure Plato, no. right? And that's why you need a pope to commune, and you need priests in order to give you and tell you what the truth is. The individual counts for nothing. The individual is living in a cave who knows nothing uh, and, 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 and doesn't have really... Uh, and, sir, I just noticed... Uh the laptop isn't connected through walls. So <laughs> okay, yeah, so yeah, you're, yeah. you're losing you're losing power. Yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> so the individual the individual in that sense is meaningless. Yeah. What what is important is, uh, it, you know, religion is this other world of forms, this other dimension. Right. And and you see that really through the Renaissance. Yeah. And then in the Renaissance, what's it a Renaissance of? It's a Renaissance of Greek thinking. Yes. It's a Renaissance of Greek identity, but primarily. What Greece? It's primarily the Greece of Aristotle, because the Greece of Plato is embedded into Christianity. It's embedded into the epistemology and into the morality, uh, primarily into the the, the 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 authoritarianism of Christianity. So, with the Renaissance, you see the rise of Aristotle, and now reason and and logic and rationality. Now, originally, as plays out in the scholastic. Right, uh, tradition within Catholicism, and but but it's rationalistic, detached from reality, using logic in order to explain God, but but ultimately it breaks free of that, and you see it in you see it in the arts. So, for example, in the Dark Ages, what you see are gargoyles. What you see is is ugly depictions of human beings no. suffering, right? Because that's life. Life yeah. is what did Hobbes call it. Uh, short, nasty, and yeah. brutish, right? Yeah. Yeah. But that's life. Life yeah. under the dark ages is short, brutish, and nasty. And and the artists depict that because their view of man is is of a decrepit. It's the Christian view of man of a sinner yeah, from sinner, from yeah. you know of original sinner from the beginning. We are sinners. We're we're nothing. We're meaningless creatures. Yeah. And this earth is a sinful earth. And, and this is Luther and the Catholic Church. This is a horrible existence we live on this earth. And then you get the Renaissance, and suddenly people discover Greece, and they discover a vision of a heroic man, right? Of of man as a heroic being, of an individual. And you get Michelangelo's David, yeah, or even Michelangelo's Pietà, where Jesus is is dying. But but think of what a Jesus he is, right? He's a muscular. Uh, efficacious, heroic Jesus yeah. with a weeping Mary who's really crushed by the death of her son. Yeah. So it's, it's very secular. It's a very secular pieta. Yeah. So that is the Renaissance. It's a rediscovery of Aristotle. And the, the peak of that, the, the, the real, uh, the, in history, uh, the, the, uh, the peak of this revival of Aristotelian think is really the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment where John Locke says you as an individual have individual rights, you as an individual own your own life, and the, and the purpose of the state is to serve you, it's to protect you, it's to defend you as an individual, but the, the moral and political 
entity that is of significance is the individual. The individual, yeah. Right? yeah. So that's a revolution. Yeah. And, and so Locke and then the founding of America, which is the manifestation of Lockean political theory, and really a manifestation of Aristotle's view of man, because what, is, what does the Declaration of Independence say? It basically says, or the whole idea of America basically says, you individuals, you can take care of yourself. You can live your life. The state is here just to protect you. Go, go flourish. Go, yeah. go succeed in life. So, so the Enlightenment is this this Aristotelian epoch, and then then you get uh, as a rebellion against the Enlightenment, kind of Plato rearing his ugly head uh, back in the form of Immanuel Kant. And Kant, what Kant says is, no, guys, reason is not efficacious. Mm. Reason doesn't actually tell us anything about reality. Mm. Reason is just, in a sense, the mind creating reality. It's, it's not seeing reality. Indeed, our mind distorts reality. Yeah. We're seeing what is embedded yeah. Yeah. in our consciousness. So the primacy of consciousness reasserts itself. That's the idea of uh, transcendental idealism in, in Kant. Uh, yes. yes. And, uh, but there's a... Uh, isn't it isn't it uh, isn't it a bit of a mischaracterization to say that he 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 uh, maybe I, I'm sure he puts less value on 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 uh, rationality on reason than say Rand. No, he redefines reason, redefines and this it, is right, the yeah. danger. It's not that he puts he. It, the problem is that he puts a lot of emphasis on reason, mm. but in a wrong definition of reason, of a reason detached from the, the real world, yeah. of a reason detached from the reality that it's observing. Yeah. Right. So what is reason? Reason is, is a faculty that observes and integrates reality, the, the, the facts of reality, yeah. the concretes that are out there in reality. But if what reason is observing is not reality, what, what is observed is... It's idea space is, is the reality. ideal as, as created by our own minds yeah. now we're returning to a platonic kind of world mm. where reason we all don't have access yeah. and now you need so for example how do we know what's right and what's wrong well we have categorical imperatives mm. well where do those come from they're just there Kant says yeah. but they're not yeah. so, so how do we find them well as an evolution from Kant, Kant doesn't say this explicitly, but if, if as an evolution from Kant, ultimately we need somebody to tell them what the cat tell us what the categorical imperatives are. And it turns out the Aryan race has different categorical imperatives than the Jews. But how does the how does the Aryan race know what those categorical imperatives are? Well, they need a Führer to be able to commune with the Aryan race. In a, in a sense, the world of forms, yeah. in order to, to, to tell all of us what we must do as Aryans in order to fulfill our categorical imperatives and, and of course the Jews are different because they have different categorical imperatives and we can we can view them as evil and therefore it's okay to kill them all right yeah. so Kant in that sense Rand believe leads directly to Hitler not in the sense that Kant is a fascist and a, you know because his political philosophy he doesn't articulate the case for fascism mm. but in his epistemology and in, in his moral code he lay in his idealism, in his, his tr transcendental idealism, right? It transcends reality. Mm. And in his moral code based on categorical imperatives, not based on real reason, mm. on reason attached to reality, he sets the stage for the whole chain, the whole philosophical chain of Hegel, Schopenhauer, Marx, Nietzsche, and then their political manifestation in Hitler. So that is all Plato reasserting himself through Kant. Mm. And uh, that we are living, the 20th century was very much a, a, a platonic era, but, but where the battle is still, wa you know, waging, and, and where America still represented Aristotle, but of course that too is fading. But, but she has this unique perspective of because ideas shape history, these are the fundamental ideas. And then she would place herself squarely on the Aristotelian side, pro-reality, A is A, reality is independent of our consciousness, reason is the faculty that observes and integrates reality, and, and uh, you know, we have this faculty that allows us to abstract from concretes in reality, create abstractions, but, but what's unique, you know, so, so, so her epistemology is very unique, she, she, and she, div she builds on Aristotle to, to, to talk about the objectivity of knowledge and how no. knowledge is objective, and then beyond that she goes to morality, because reason is ultimately a fact of the in individual, it's not a collective thing, there's no collective consciousness, there's not collective reasoning, mm. only individuals yeah. can reason. Uh, she views the individual as uh, w w what's, you know, individuals are alive, individuals eat, individuals think. So individuals are what are important morally. 
and and she is a rational egoist so she believes that self-interest is is the goal of morality morality should be should be the study of the values and virtues that lead to a good life yeah. again m somewhat like aristotle's flourishing mm. where, where you study what leads to a good life and she would say the good life is is based on the what is required for human beings to survive and to thrive as human being and, and what's the number one thing that allows people to thrive and survive it's to think it's it's to use our mind it's to be rational so for her rationality but do you don't mean virtue. Do you don't think that uh, objectivism is, is like the philosophy for the 21st century? If Plato was more the 20th century and Aristotle uh, before that? Well, I certainly hope it is. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I believe it is. I, I believe it's the philosophy for every century. It's, yeah. it's the right philosophy. And I think that it is gaining ground. And I, th and I hope that in the 21st century it becomes a dominant philosophy. That's yeah. at least the goal, my goal. And the goal of the Ayn Rand Institute is to make uh, objectivism the, the, the dominant philosophy uh, in the world in the 21st century, the, yeah. the, the, the most important secular philosophy yeah. uh, in the world. And, and, you know, you're seeing a lot of interest in a philosophy uh, globally now, whereas it used to be just in the United States, I think, because of the Internet and because of the, the, the scale that the Internet allows ideas to spread in completely new ways yeah. right we're doing this yeah, right. right now anybody in the world will be able to listen to this and watch this at the marginal cost to us of exactly zero exactly yeah. and and that's unprecedented that's bigger than Gutenberg's printing press it's bigger than anything yeah. so I think because of that you there's an opportunity to get her philosophy to become a global philosophy and I do think that she is the philosophy of the 21st century I, I also think that Ayn Rand is ultimately the first American philosopher, really the only American philosopher. So even though she was born in Russia. Yeah. What would Bert Russell say? Oh, he's English. He's English. English, English, English right? But right what now. would James Dewey say? James Dewey. I would say James Dewey is one of the destroyers of American yeah. philosophy. Or, or uh, you know, I, I'd say that the American philosophers, the, the pragmatists, yeah. those are the only really American right. philosophers before him, man, they are all set to destroy the project of the founding fathers not to defend it. Mm. Ayn Rand is the first philosopher in America whose philosophy really is 100% consistent with the founding of America. No. Yeah. I mean, if you read the Declaration of Independence in particular, but the Constitution is well properly understood, yeah. they are completely consistent with Ayn Rand's philosophy. But what she does is that the founders, the founders of America had a, a, were great political philosophers. They really understood political philosophy. But they were, they, were, they were very conventional, and that means Christian, in their morality. Right. So their morality was, so, so let's think about what mo uh, Christian morality is. Christian morality, or morality of, of most of, of, the tr of, of the last 2,000 years in the West uh, is a morality of selflessness. So when we think about what is g the good, what is moral, what is just, we think about being selfless. Mm. We think about self-sacrifice. Uh, Mother Teresa is ideal morally. Mm. Why? Because she gave up a middle class life. She gave up going to school like you guys do. She gave up making money. She gave up being successful, flourishing, right? And she chose a life of suffering. And if you read her diaries, you realize she suffered. She didn't have fun, right? And dedicated her life to helping other people, not even helping other people succeed, helping other people not die. Not die, yeah. Not die. Because she didn't believe in success because she believed the meek shall inherit the earth and therefore she, she wanted them to stay poor yeah. but she didn't want them to die because suffering was good suffering was virtuous yeah, so she wanted them to suffer explicitly wanting them to stay poor right? yes just, explicitly yeah. wanting them to stay poor and explicitly wanting them to suffer and she suffered and she believed that God wanted us to suffer and that this was the purpose of life was suffering and, and that is why she is viewed as a, as a saint because she is all of, I mean think about it I often say in my lectures have you ever seen a painting Mm. of a smiling happy saint mm. no. no because no. <laughs> the whole point of sainthood is to suffer and die yeah. Yeah. right so sacrifice suffering is 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 the virtue yeah. what Ayn Rand is saying is no <laughs> life is to be lived life is to be enjoyed yeah. uh, the purpose of life is to be happy it's to achieve eudaimonia in Aristotelian terms it's, it's to achieve human flourishing and it's 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 uh that's what ethics should guide us towards. We should, we should, philosophers should 
educate us about virtues that lead to flourishing, to success. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So she challenges this ethic that even the founders had. And I think that the, in the end, America was founded on a conflict, hmm. a political philosophy that says that every individual has an inalienable right to pursue his own happiness hmm. versus a morality that says that the moral duty is, like in Kant, to sacrifice, to be selfless, right? Yeah. So Kantian philosophy, this is before Kant, but Kantian philosophy, Christian philosophy, dominates the ethics. So America was founded on a on quicksand. The, the, the quicksand is the morality of Christianity. What Ayn Rand does is she takes the political philosophy of Locke and the founders yeah. and grounds it on a morality and epistemology that are solid, that have real foundations. And, and in that sense, she is the philosopher of America. Mm -hmm. And I think it's why she's most popular in America, because her, her ideas resonate with the kind of spirit of the American people. And I think the fact that she's doing so well internationally now suggests to me that that spirit of freedom, of individualism, is now becoming much more global. Yeah, okay. I'd like to. I'd like to go back to the. Um, you unpacked the ideas of, of Ayn Rand very well, and y you highlighted, which is one of the main tenets, that one of the great fundamental ideas behind objectivism is this uh, upholding of reason yes. as the as the main vehicle of, to interpret r truths from from reality, basically. Uh, and I'd, I'd like to challenge that a little bit. Sure. And uh, there's this. I mean, there's a big a big debate. In, in economics, between classical economics and behavioral economics. Yeah. Basically, behavioral economics based, I think, mainly on the research, at least very greatly based on the research of Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, sure. uh, presented sure. in the book, Thinking sure. Fast and Slow. You're very, I'm certain you're very aware of, sure. of, of sure. this. And, uh, and also, I mean, um, and just a short, uh, just a short summary, so that people know what we're talking about. The book "Thinking Fast and Slow." Basically, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky define the human brain as having two systems: system one and system two. System one being our main mode, uh, brain mode, and um, uh, where where the the reactive brain, the intuitive brain, the feeling brain, the no. the the brain of habits, and then the system two brain, which is the the brain mode that requires effort, requires uh, re it's the rational thinking brain. It's yes. it's our reasoning faculties, basically no. a scientific mapping of how our how our reasoning abilities work, and then even before that. Um, if we if we go way back to when I'd say uh, rationality started flourishing in, in modern philosophy with Francis Bacon with the scientific method mm -hmm. uh, in, in Novus Organum when he wrote it in sixteen doesn't matter sixteen hundreds yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, he even he mapped out these the, the idols of the mind basically four idols of the mind which were these four um, four categories of different uh, fallacies um, uh, different um, preconceived notions things that be people have in their minds that, that can inhibit scientific reasoning mm -hmm. so these uh, uh, maybe making this distinction between uh, people who oppo might oppose Rand might say that yes humans certainly are reasonable they have rationality of course it'd be it'd be not only wrong but disrespectful to our to our advances as a human as yeah. a species yeah. to say that we don't have yeah. reasoning capabilities because that's that's the way we advance and our welfare grows etc etc but that there are limitations and there are other forces in play that we just cannot ignore as as human beings that have evolved yeah i mean there's no question there are other forces in play but the fact is that all human knowledge qua knowledge comes from reason right. all human advancement all human achievements come from reason and it, so so let's take this uh, fast versus slow right mm. so the idea is the fast brain is intuitive it's emotional it's quick no. and the slow brain is rational thought out well where did where do these come from right so uh, Ayn Rand would argue that ultimately it is the slow brain the rational the 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 in thoughtful people that commands the fast brain. That is, for example, um, one of the things that, that Coleman talks about is, is the, the ability of the fast brain to, to get things very, very quickly and, and to, to discover patterns very, very quickly and, and to know stuff very, very quickly. In the slow brain, it takes it a while to catch up in a sense, right? But why does that happen? It happens because the slow brain has trained 
right? So we have trained our brain to see certain patterns over and over and over again. Mm. So somebody's playing the violin, doesn't have to think about playing yeah. the violin because they practice 10, yeah, what is yeah. it, the 10,000 hour rule? Yeah. <laughs> and it becomes intuitive. The intuition is a consequence of training our brain using the slow methodology. Mm. And the only way, now, if we don't do that, if we rely just on the intuition, now the intuitions are there, the emotion is there, right. even if we don't use reason to train it. Mm. But what happens is if we rely on that, we screw up. We screw up. Right. And, 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 and he shows this, right? So, so all our cognitive biases mm. are all fast brain cognitive biases, right? Yeah. In, in a sense, they're emotions. And, and Rand would say, I think, that yes, if we default on thinking, if we don't use reason, then we're at the mercy of emotions. Right. And that places at the mercy of cognitive biases. The whole point of studying what those cognitive biases are mm. is to use our slow brain to overcome the biases. No. To use our slow brain to say, wait a minute, I'm not going to make a quick decision because I know I have certain biases and, and that, that are emotional. Yeah. And I'm now going to try to overcome those biases by slowly using logic and using rationality yeah. to guide my life. And people who rely on the emotions to live their life screw up. I mean, you tell this to most people and they say, yeah, absolutely. When you screw up, it's usually because you didn't think it through. Yeah. When yeah. you screw up, it's usually because you've, you've let your emotions dominate you. Yeah. And, and what Rand is saying is, no, Decisions should be made on reason. Yeah, unless you don't have time. Unless you have to make a quick decision, and then you make the quick decision based on your intuition or, or, if it doesn't or the emotion, yeah. or if it doesn't matter. Yeah. But, but every other decision should be based on reason. I mean, even something that has deep emotional grounding, like uh, who to marry, which is clearly guided by an emotion of love. Yeah. You shouldn't act on that emotion of love to the extent of, kind of committing yourself to the rest of your life yeah. unless you understand where it comes from. Unless you have validated it, if you will, f through reason. That you understand, okay, yes, this person I love really is a good person and I love them for the right reason, not yeah. the wrong reasons. Then go ahead and commit long term. But if you're not sure where this love thing is, it, it might go away or it might turn out that you love them and it's not really there what you think you love them for. Yeah. So even when something like love, which is a powerful emotion, a strong emotion, emotion you should cherish and, and live by, you still have to validate it through reason if you're gonna act on it, uh, particularly if you're gonna commit to it long term. So at the end of the day, what Rand is saying is it, when you make decisions, particularly important decisions, reason is your guide because the fact is that reason is cognition. Mm -hmm. Emotions are not cognition. Emotion are quick instinctual responses to stuff usually based or always based on decisions conclusions you made sometime in the past right so yeah. emotions are not independent of thought they are a consequence of thought but they're subconscious yeah so you might not know where your emotions are coming from uh, you, they might be based on decisions or conclusions you came to for example when you were very young before you were really fully reasoning cap nah. capability. And if we had a rational psychotherapy, right, if we had rational psychology, which I, I don't think we really have, but if we had such a science, then it really is the science of trying to understand what kind of conclusion lead to what kind of emotions and how do we undo bad conclusions we came to when we were young that are resulting in bad emotions. So if you have a fear of flying, maybe at some point you came to some conclusion about heights or about flying or about whatever, how do you undo that? And, and uh, that's not easy to do, but that's what psychology should be the science of. So uh, Rand wouldn't deny the cognitive biases or the emotion or the, the kind of intuition, but she would say, A, it's not clear that it's cognitive biases, it, you know, because it's not clear there's cognition going on there. Um, but they clearly are biases. Yeah. But then the role of reason is to help us overcome those biases. The role of reason is to study them, to understand them, and then to make the right kind of decisions. Absolutely. But, to your, but to your example about marriage, if you think about the divorce rates, is it then, could you say that most people are unreasonable, but you should push towards being more reasonable? Yeah, no, but look, most pe we're not taught to be reasonable. Yeah. No, nobody teaches us 
that what's most important in life is to think. Now, I don't know about the Finnish educational yeah. system, which is supposed to be the best in the world. <laughs> so, so, so maybe they do teach it in Finland. By the way, public. <laughs> I know. I know. Well, we, we can talk about that. <laughs> Just because it's the best in the world doesn't mean it's good. Okay. Which, right. Yeah, right? which is the difference, right? right. And, and I would argue it, it, even in Finland it would be much better if it was private. But yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing that. But yeah. the, the, the ch what we should be teaching kids is, is critical thinking skills. It's how to think and how to think about the world, not to just think an abstraction detached from reality, but how to really use reason. And w and, but more importantly than that, what we don't teach people to do is the importance of thinking to their own lives. No. Because we don't teach them that their own lives are important. We teach them that other people's lives are important. So we teach them that they should sacrifice, that they should live for other people. I mean, my mother taught me to be selfless. That's what most mothers teach us because that's what the, pre the priests teach and that's what the philosophers teach. Mm -hmm. But imagine a world in which we taught kids to be selfish, but, but, but properly selfish, which means rationally selfish, which means therefore they had to think before they acted. They had to be no. They had to use cognition, they had to use reason. Only when you use reason, only when you use your rational faculty, can you be truly selfish. But imagine if, if we kept, when little kids, we always told them, think, think, think. Stop before you act. Think about that emotion. Figure it out. Solve problems. That's what life is about. Then maybe people would think before they got married would think before they did a lot of no. stupid things that people do. Mm -hmm. They would think before they elect the stupid leaders we, we tend to choose in, in politics. They would think before they did anything. I think the world would be a completely different place. So her point is not that people are rational, period. Yeah. The point is that people can be rational, but rationality requires effort. Right. Rationality is an achievement. No. Rationality is something that people need to strive to. Right. It's not no. easy being yeah. rational. It's, it's not, not easy yeah. being rational. And in the sense that it's not easy to be rational, it's not easy to be selfish. Mm. So Ayn Rand would be say to be self-interested, to be an egoist in her sense of the word, yeah. is hard work because it requires you as your primary virtue to be rational, right? To seek reason as your primary value. That isn't easy. So. If you want to be selfish, she says, think, think, think. Mm. Don't act on emotion, yeah. right? And that's an achievement to, to, to strive to. And, and yes, divorce rates, I think, are one of the indications. Well, there are two things going on. One, it's an indication that a lot of people are not being rational. Yeah. But it's also an indication that it's hard. That is, to make a decision about who you want to spend the rest of your life with is a very, very hard decision. And it, it doesn't surprise me, and I don't think it should surprise anybody, yeah. that we're not you know that it's hard to make a decision about the next 50 years of our yeah, life and yeah, most of us make yeah. mistakes about it so it's not always lack of rationality it's just mistakes and the fact is that people um you know when they get married are maybe different than 20 years later when they've yeah. maybe have different values and have grown apart now i've been married 34 years so yeah. so i made a right decision but i don't i wouldn't say that it's because I made a rational decision back then i i tried to yeah. I, I mean it to some extent i got lucky to some extent, uh, you know, we grew up together because we got married so young. And to some extent, it's because not just when we were married did we choose to be rational, but that our lives have been guided by a particular philosophy. So we've, we've grown up together on the same path because it was on the same philosophical path. Yeah. Um, when you get married and you don't have clear values and virtues, uh, it's much more likely that you would grow apart because your values and virtues, you know, here, in my case, we grew up with the same values and virtues because we explicitly identified a philosophy that we shared right at the beginning. Mm. Can we unpack the idea of, of the rational self-interest a little bit? Because sure. it's, it's especially selfishness is a word with plenty of connotations. Oh, yeah. Yeah, some people, people might not have, uh, have a clear understanding. Like, mainly, even when I encounter, uh, I'm not sure if you would consider yourself libertarian, but when, whenever you talk to uh, libertarians who are Randian yep. and they, they um, express the idea of rational self-interest or selfishness, it's always... Uh, the ma mainly the source, of, the main source of information is usually the uh, the, well, the the opponents who misunderstand, yes. usually, uh, or at least uh, characterized by the the Randians themselves it's misunderstood. So I'd like yeah. to hear from you personally. Uh, wh what what is the uh, what is the role? First of all, I think wh well defines rational self self interest, and what is the role of altruism in such a system? Sure. So, so you have to define both irrational self interest and altruism. Yeah. 
because because part of the confusion is the definition of altruism, which is which is I think most people hold the wrong definition of altruism. Rational self-interest is viewing your own interest as primary. Your own life is 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 uh, your own flourishing is your goal, your moral goal in life. Mm. So it's. It's living in order to achieve your personal happiness yeah. and personal success. Yeah. Now, that is not subjective or doing whatever you feel like doing, as we've discussed to this point, right? Figuring out what is going to be good for me over the next 50 years, figuring out on any given decision what is going to be good for me, what's going to be bad for me tomorrow, never mind 10 years and 20 years from now, is not easy, and it requires thinking, thinking, thinking. So if you wanted to boil down Ayn Rand's egoism or selfishness to one term, it's think, right? That's the commandment, if you will. It's not a commandment. It's a, right? Think. Figure out what's going to be good for you. So in that sense, it's not about doing what feels good in the moment. It's about what's really good, what's objectively good for you over the long run. So if there's a line of cocaine here, Right. Yes. Clearly, if I sniff it, it's going to make me feel good. Right. Yeah. I'm going to get a high. Yeah. But I also know rationally that sniffing it is probably not good for me in the long run. I, you know, I could easily get addicted to it. While I'm high, I might do stupid things. I certainly will probably say stupid things. Yeah. Be a good podcast. I <laughs> it would. Well, maybe maybe a bad podcast. It depends on your audience. But. Um, and, and if I get addicted to it, I know from experience that people don't do well when they get addicted yeah, to yeah. drugs. So if I think about it, I realize that taking the cocaine is bad for me, mm. even though in the moment it will give me a high. So usually selfishness is viewed as pursuing whatever it is that will make you feel good in the moment. Now, that's hedonism. That's not egoism. Hedonism is the, is the seeking out of pleasure for pleasure's sake, right? Yeah. That's, That's not what objectivism is. That's not what Ayn Rand is advocating. Ayn Rand is advocating for rational selfishness. So pursuing what's rationally in your self-interest over the long run. So, for example, let's take, uh, let's take a few more and then we'll get to altruism. Sure. So is it, is it appropriate to lie, steal, or cheat is, is always comes up. Well, no, because I, I tell people, you, you want to figure out that lying is not in your self-interest, just run a small experiment. Yeah. Spend a day lying to your best friend. Just everything yeah. you encounter, lie to them and yeah. see how it works out. And it's a disaster, right? Yeah. If you lie to people, it ultimately turns out, as for you, it turns out to be a disaster. They won't talk to you again. They don't trust you. They won't do business with you if you're in business. Uh, but also, it makes your life very complicated because you have to hold in your mind the lies and the truth and, and multiple, multiple things. And our mind is an integrating machine. So if you, you know, there's a term in computers, garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. And if you stuff your mind with lies, it soon it, it, it integrates with the truth and you can't tell what is what. It's just a bad strategy. The same with stealing. If you steal, then you're basically admitting to yourself subconsciously that you cannot produce in order to live. And it actually destroys self-esteem. So, so, so and self-esteem is necessary for the achievement of happiness, the achievement of flourishing. So Ayn Rand identifies three values as necessary for, for human survival and success. Uh, reason, purpose, and self-esteem. Self-esteem is this idea, this implicit idea that I know I can survive on this earth. I know I'm deserving of this life. And if you steal, you're undercutting that. Yeah, but you could I quickly challenge this though? Sure. Couldn't you defend basically slavery with this in a sense that you said that that uh, uh, it helped myself, but it does, uh, but it's really bad for the <laughs> people working for you. But it's really good for yourself because you get free la free labor. No, two reasons. One is slavery is economically stupid it, it doesn't work economically it's a disaster economically and all you have to do is compare south before the civil war and the north before the civil war who was richer by yeah. far the north was who was more innovative more more uh, uh, prosperous more productive the north was by far than the south and the reason is that slavery is 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 a bad economic system but much more fundamental than that yeah. you cannot have a moral system that says it's okay for me, or, or the, the, the highest value is for me to pursue my own flourishing, but not for you. Yeah. 
that is that is a, that's philosophically completely corrupt. So if you hold a moral system, it has to be universal moral system. So what's good? So so if I am to pursue my own self interest, that has to be what's right for everybody. And if if it's wrong for you to use force and to use coercion against me in stopping me in pursuit of my own my own happiness, then it's wrong for me to use force and coercion against you to stop you. So so by by me treating you like a slave. Yeah. By me using force against you, I am undercutting the justification of my own morality. I'm undercutting. And therefore, I can never flourish and be happy and be successful. And all the portrayals of the South, of this, I don't know, the, the, the gone with the wind kind of portrayals. Of yeah. This wonderful society that, you know, had a great life. It's, it's nonsense. That's not what yeah. life was about. This was a, a torn, a morally corrupt, slavery is a corrupting institution. Mm. And again, this is why they lost in the end. They yeah. had to lose. Yeah. Right? So, so lying, stealing, and cheating are not in your rational self-interest. They undercut your self-interest. They're destroyers of your own soul. They're destroying of your own ability to be happy and to flourish. So to be happy and to flourish, you have to discover, and it's not easy, but you have to discover the virtues into the actions that you need to take in order to achieve flourishing. And Ayn Rand identify seven. They might be more, they might be less, but the point is that that's what morality should be. It should be the discovery of the right virtues. So she discovers seven, rationality, like independence, you have to think for yourself, productiveness, you have to produce yeah. something in order to live. You, you, you can't live as a leech off of others, and if you don't produce, you'll die, right? Uh, 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 and, and being a leech, again, is destructive to your own self-esteem. Yeah. Uh, you, you have to have integrity. You can't believe in ideas and not act on them mm. because the action is, is ultimately what what your life is about it's about acting yeah. And, yeah. and so uh, and and you have to have pride in your own achievements because that's how you get self-esteem so you have to be able to recognize and you have to commit yourself to being a good moral person that's what pride is a commitment to morality a commitment to virtue um you know justice you have to treat people the way they deserve uh, based on the value they have Mm. in the world and, and it to you basically uh, I'm missing one you know and you have to be honest yeah. Yeah. because because rationality demands honesty so now let's think about altruism yeah right so what is altruism now most people think altruism is being nice to people but that's not what altruism means right altruism is an ism it's an ideology an ideology that says what well who is the first philosopher to coin the term altruism it was Augustine Comte Right, Augustine Comte, the, the French philosopher. Augustine Comte says altruism is the idea in ethics that the purpose of your life, the purpose of your life, is to serve others. You must sacrifice to others. You must do for others everything. If you think about the benefit to you of helping somebody else, Oops. it's <laughs> not moral. Yeah, it's outside the realm of morality because you thought of yourself. So the whole idea of altruism as an ideology is the negation of self, S complete service to the community, to the others, to define others any way you want. It's the antithesis of rational egoism. It's the exact opposite. Now, does that mean that objectivism or rational egoism s means be mean, nasty, rude to other people? No. Well, of course not. Other people are an incredible value to me. Right? They produce the stuff that I consume. They, they, and, and I'm not just talking about material well-being. They, they, produ they, they produce music and art and all the wonderful things around me. But more than that, they're human beings. They share that essential humanity with me, right? So they, they are other rational beings. So, you know, we share values. We share certain things. And, and as a consequence of that, y you know, a rational egoist is, has a benevolent attitude towards other people. It's friendly yeah. and polite and, and, you know, objectivist. You know, some people think uh, objectivists or rationally selfish people wouldn't hold the door for somebody. I mean, that's ridiculous. <laughs> I, I, I mean, it, it's part of being alive and, and having a, 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 a friendly, positive exchange with other people that you that politeness is 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 an important part of that it's not a primary no. virtue it's not the most important thing in the world but it's something that makes life more enjoyable and more pleasant um, but being selfish means valuing other people now unless you have reason not to value them right mm. if you're a lying cheating sob 
Yeah. I don't value you. I'm not going to be nice to you. I'm not holding the door to you. I'm not going to hire you. I'm not going to trade with you, right? Yeah. So it's this is this is all a consequence of of Ayn Rand's idea of justice, the, yeah. the idea of the virtue of justice. Y- you you treat people the way they deserve, and if you don't know somebody, the assumption for egoist is that they're good. No. Yeah. Right? Because most people are good. Yeah. And and it, 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 it's only if you have information about somebody is not being good, you treat them badly. Otherwise, it, it, so in the sense of that people talk about uh, being polite and being nice and being friendly and even being charitable, absolutely egoists would be charitable. Not indiscriminately charitable. I'm not going to hand out dollar bills to anybody who comes and asks for it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But... I'm going to hand out, uh, but if somebody comes to me to help and they're basically a good person mm. and, and, and I think that bad stuff has happened to them for no fault of their own, I'm happy to help yeah. them. Yeah. And, and, and uh, you know, rational, egoistic people would be charitable uh, to a limit to the extent that it promoted their own values. But my values are very expansive. Yeah. yeah. There's so much to, to grab on here, but we, we said the last part is a very good segue, I think, to, to uh, the role of government because you sort of touched on it with, with, the, with the charity. Thing, yeah. yeah. Charity versus sure. uh, government welfare. Yeah. Uh, I wrote some notes here. I might get back to them. We might circle back to these points sure. about, sure. about sure. selfishness, but um, I'd like to get here now. So uh, the role of charity, the basic, the basic left argument against charity voluntary char- charity is is the fact that we there are there are certainly people it's uh, it's it's uh, you can't deny it. there are people who uh, n- not ne- can't help themselves there are people who are poor o- uh, poor off and there are they are poor they they maybe they have some um, sort of disability they can't help themselves uh, mistakes happen things happen uh, variables yeah yep. uh, and also people inherit their, usually inherit their uh, demographic, their class, et cetera, et cetera. So um, there are certainly people who need to be helped. Is, is, uh, is a government system, a system of go- government welfare, the argument would be uh, that if we have this institution where, where, uh, where people by, by mandate, by, you would say by coercion, um, uh, give money to or, or hand out money to and, uh, and, and it allows uh, the country to provide this platform or provide this uh, safety net. Um, the, the leftist argument would usually be that certainly this system would be um, uh, handled by by charity, but but is it? Um, but it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be by the whim of these people. It should. It, 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 or is it, is it a wrong characterization? Well, whim is the wrong characterization to begin with. Right? Choice is the, is the better choice, characterization. Right? right? Okay. But but beyond that. I challenge your, your, your primary assumption because, because I think it's way too broad. Okay. There's a tiny fraction of a percent of the human population who cannot take care of themselves. Mm. It's tiny. Most people, including very poor people, can take care of themselves. And I, I, think, it's, I think it's very platonic of us mm-hmm. and, and very elitist of us mm-hmm. and very condescending of us to say to poor people, you can't take care of yourself. Yes, they can. And indeed... If you look at every society where poor people have been basically given the f- same freedoms as we in the middle class and the upper classes t- take for granted, if you will, they take care of themselves fine. And indeed, many of them rise into the middle class and some of them become super rich. Right? So if you take 19th century America or you take Hong Kong of the 20th century, mm. where there were no safety nets or, very, or only voluntary safety nets, but, but relatively small, right. and where basically all people had was freedom. Mm. And, and the protection uh, protection of government from coercion and from fraud and, and from stuff like that, right? And basically left alone. Poor people do very well, right? When when immigrants came to America in the 19th century, um, you know, take my my Jewish my Jewish uh, uh, ancestors, yeah. who did actually didn't go to America, but but those who did go to America, they were poor, they were ignorant. These were farmers in the shtetls of Poland and, and uh, in Lithuania and Germany and Ukraine and Russia. They, they, they were farmers. They, they, they were tradesmen. But they had no wealth. They came with nothing. Right? They left everything in Russia. Not that they had anything in Europe. Right? And they showed up in, uh, on the east side of New York with nothing. And they were given nothing. And yet, within two generations, they were middle class, and within three generations, they were upper middle class, right? Yeah. Why? Because suddenly they were free. 
suddenly they were able and they value, you know, whatever reason they valued education. And the same thing happened with the Poles mm -hmm. and with the Irish and with the Italians who came to America in the 19th century, just like today. It's the poorest, of the, you know, the Mexicans who come, right? It's the poorest yeah. who come, right? Mm -hmm. And they came to America with nothing. And they succeeded and they did fine without any government handouts, without any government protection. They did fine. Who came to, who came to Hong Kong? Hong Kong 75 years ago was a little fishing village with a few tens of thousands of people. Yeah. Today, seven and a half million people yeah. live there. They came from all over Asia. Who came? The poorest. The people who escaped, or, or even if they weren't poor, they left everything behind because they escaped to come to Hong Kong. And what did Hong Kong offer them? Nothing except the protection of property rights, yeah. protection of, of contract law. That's it, a contract. Mm. But has it in America poverty and homelessness been on the rise since Well, the but, but we have century. a welfare state today, and I would blame the welfare state for poverty. And, and, and since the war on poverty started, yeah. poverty has been flat or increased a little bit. So the war on poverty is what creates poverty. Welfare, in my view, is what creates poverty. Because what is welfare? Welfare is institutionalization of poverty. Yeah. Right? What I tell you when I give you welfare is you're not able to take care of yourself. Yeah. You're so stupid and incompetent. Uh, you need my help. So I do two things by doing that. One, by giving you money, I reduce your incentive to work, reduce your ambition to be successful because I'm giving you just enough to survive. Right. But secondly, and much more importantly, I destroy your self-esteem because what I'm, what, what I'm basically telling you is you're too incompetent to take care of yourself. So, I, uh, and what happens, if you look at America, is mobility has shrunk. And the reason mobility has shrunk is because we've institutionalized a certain segment of the population to poverty. We've destroyed their ambition. We've told them they're worthless. We've told them they shouldn't strive upwards to be successful. And therefore, there they are. They're stuck. And then we do all kinds of other stuff like minimum wage laws and licensing laws, which basically hold them and make, them make sure they never get that first job yeah. so they can't advance. So we create a class that is poor. Mm. America never used to have classes. Mm. And one of the, uh, I in my view, because one of the reasons they never had classes because there was huge mobility. You, you could become rich one day and poor the next yeah. because you could lose it all. And you could be, if you look, if you think about the people who are so-called robber barons, most of them started with nothing. Uh, 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 Rockefeller was a, was a poor kid. Carnegie was a poor kid. These were, these were kids who had nothing, not even an education. Mm. And look how uh, they became the richest people in the world. That was the kind yeah. of society that there was. So, but is, isn't it a bit of a selection bias because it's two people? Two oh, people. yeah. But 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 if you if you go back and you look, I mean, two of the richest, right? Because yeah. we know their names. Yeah. But there were hundreds, if not thousands, and maybe even millions of people like yeah. that. And look, I'll talk about this in the talk later. The history of the human race is a history of poverty. Hmm. Right. We were always poor. Ninety-five percent no. of people all over the world mm -hmm. throughout all of history have been poor. Uh, defined as less than three dollars a day in today's dollars, if you know, or less than two dollars a day, even. Ninety-five percent of all human beings in all of history have been poor, right? Over the last 200 years, because of capitalism, because of freedom, we're all rich. So if you look at the West, yeah. Nobody's poor by the standard of three dollars a day. Yeah, right. So yes, poor people in America are poorer than everybody else. Yeah, but they're richer than ninety-nine percent of all the people who've ever lived in all of human history. Yeah, poor people because they have cell phones, they have air conditioning, they have a car, they have a home. So, and and what made that possible? What made that possible is capitalism. What made that possible is a free market. What made that possible is is just leaving people free. So, but, but let me go to, to a philosophical point here. So, so uh, let's finish this point in a second. So there's a fraction of people, a tiny small portion of people who cannot take care of themselves, mm. but it's very small. Yes, sure. We can do a much better job of taking care of them if we leave it to voluntary charity than we do if we do it by the state. Because it's such a small number, because people will be motivated. When people are motivated, they do a better job than when they're forced to do something. Uh, uh, charities, some charities, uh, there'll be competition between charities. Some charities work better than other charities. So you get the same impact as you do in other uh, voluntary market transactions. Uh, and, and it's not a big deal. It's not a lot of money. And indeed, again, if you go back to 19th century America, there were all kinds of things. You know, you could buy insurance in America against poverty. 
so there was insurance you could pay every month yeah. and then if, if if you lost your job or something it would so there was private unemployment insurance hmm. there were there were all kinds of voluntary mechanisms and voluntary associations to protect you from bad stuff happening to you but when we institutionalize them into the state know what happens the number of people who need our help suddenly grows because again we, we convey to them this idea that they need our help yeah. but then there's always somebody that at the margin needs more right so let's say we de define poverty at I don't know at a certain level of income right but then what about the people just above that income they need a little bit of help as well so it, it keeps creeping up and and then you get the the, the, the kind of Scandinavian yeah. welfare state where half the people are getting welfare, uh, you know, or more than half the people in the United States today. Forty-seven percent of all Americans get something from the government. Mm. Yeah. Now, don't tell me forty-seven percent of Americans cannot take care of themselves. Mm. That's nonsense, and it's nonsense that sixty percent of Scandinavians can't take care of themselves. It's just not true. I I, I apologize. <laughs> I guess Finland's not Scandinavian. So <laughs> right. Finns, right? You didn't even know this. <laughs> well, I know this, so I, so I shouldn't have said it. But, yeah, but, yeah, but yeah. when I look at a map, it looks yeah, like you are. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, but but the point is that that what we do is we do a disservice. So if you took it to the good people who really need welfare, yeah. it's such a tiny little fraction that of course we can take care of our voluntarily. But but once you accept the idea that there's a significant number of people that needs our help. Mm. Then you fall into the platonic trap of why they need help. Well, they can't think for themselves. They're not responsible. Mm. So, for example, why do we need Social Security in America? You know, planning for pensions, right? Yeah. Government provided pensions. Why? Oh, because people are too stupid to save for themselves. Why are they too stupid to save for themselves? Because they're in a cave and they only see shadows and we need philosopher yeah, kings yeah. who can see. So, once you fall into that trap, the camera is beeping for some reason. Battery. Did okay. the recording stop? I don't. No, just uh, once you fall into that trap, then that group expands and expands and expands, and you give more and more and more power to that group of philosopher kings at the top, and there, there really is no end to it, and that's what we're experiencing in the modern welfare state, that it keeps growing and growing and growing, and there's no end to it. And I can certainly agree with the, with one, one thing that's, that's, I think, more or less evident in Finnish society, and that's, uh, that's uh, uh, the fact that I don't think it doesn't matter. Yeah, think it mattered. Yeah. Battery, battery died. died. Yeah. yeah. All right. No, no replacement battery. battery. No, no. I was thinking about. I know All right. Charger here, oh, you'll 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 put it up. Uh, you'll, you'll cut it. You'll, you'll cut edit it, it nicely, yeah. so the cut is good. Yeah. We'll Photoshop this this empty part <laughs> some, somehow. But there's a one thing I certainly agree on, and that's uh, that's uh, might might also be the the let's see the pessimism in Finnish culture. It's uh, there's a characteristic pessimism in Finnish culture. It's it's actually there's this uh, German uh, author who moved to Finland, and people warned him about uh, Finnish Is jealousy, yeah. Finnish pessimism, oh, yeah. and 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 he the German author said, well, in every country, everyone's jealousy is a universal thing. But then he lived here for like ten years, and he's like, no, no, it's 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 actually a special thing. Finnish well, jealousy. I mean, but, but it's but, but but yeah, I mean, but it's it's very typical of kind of Germanic. Uh, uh, People who take continental philosophy seriously and take this platonic view, yeah. I think it's somewhat related to the weather you have and maybe yeah. to being in northern Europe. But but, but, but I th yeah, there's a, there's a bit of a sense of this. Uh, I, I don't know how what else way to characterize it. Maybe this Nietzschean master slave morality kind of attitude yeah. where where um, the there's this dichotomy between the masters and the and the slaves and and one one important factor in it is 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 the fact that they they consider each other to be evil. They consider each other be to be the on the wrong side of the moral yep. spectrum, so which means that the slaves they don't have admissions to rise up to the master master level. But they well, partially because, because they're told they, they cannot, and, and right. they're, because they're different types, types of human beings. They are they are the people in the cave. So it all goes back to this platonic dichotomy yeah. uh, 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 in, in, in differentiation of people in that way, which Kant and then Nietzsche follow up on, and and you know. The, you know, Nietzsche's Ubermensch is, is Plato's philosopher king. I mean, right? So it's... But, but there's definitely Europe has a pessimism that you don't find in America. And, and, and I think one of the virtues of Asia is that in, in you, you find it certainly in, in Chinese society, you don't seem to see the same kind of pessimism. And I think that explains part of this incredible success that China has had over the last... Partially, it's, it's the... It's their, uh, it's the freedom, mm. but uh, Chinese are, all, are very entrepreneurial, and 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 I think that comes from a much more optimistic uh, 
or in my view, realistic view of, of the world than, than Europeans typically have. Now, what's interesting is Europeans who went to America mm. tend to become optimists. Right. We had to right. Be, you had to be a bit of an optimist to go. And yes, you had to be, yeah, yeah, because you packed up and left everything that was comfortable and yeah. went. No idea what we and, and I think in that sense, there's been a brain drain or more accurately, a spiritual drain, right? The people with the spirit of individualism, the people with the spirit of, of, of positivism, of, of the idea that things that can be done, that you can be successful, that you can achieve something, mm. packed up from Europe and left Europe yeah. and went to America. And that explains part of the differences in, in attitude between the... I mean, Europe took German war, uh, idealism seriously, mm. and America never did until recently, until the last, you know, uh, over the last hundred years, it's been slowly creeping into American society, yeah. and that's why America's on the decline, because it's becoming more like Europe. I mean, yeah. the, 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 okay. the evil in American society yeah. is just becoming uh, more like European society. And even if you think, even when you think about things like the attitude towards wealth, right, in, in Finland... Like in Scandinavia, like in the rest of Europe, there's a strong sense of envy. If somebody somebody is very rich, we despise them. No. We hate them, right? And 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 uh, in America, there's never been that sense of envy. And I think part of it comes from from a, a a sense in Europe that wealth is is by definition stolen, because if you go back long enough in history. Uh, how did people become wealthy? How did they become aristocrats, right? An aristocrat is just a good thief, right? A thief who got away with it, yeah. right? That's because the only way in the old days to make money wasn't to make it, was to steal it. Yeah. It's to take it. So in the, in, the, in the European psyche, if you will, there's this association of wealth with thievery, with, with robbery, with theft, mm. right? You see it in, 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 uh, in a story like Robin Hood, right? The, 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 the way Prince John in Robin Hood became wealthy is by taking the money from the poor or taking the money from other people, and that's how he becomes rich, right? And that's what's in the psyche of the Europeans. But in America, because it's a new country, mm. and it's a country really created with the dawn of capitalism, it's a country in which wealth is created, I mean, uh, Ayn Rand says that the American people are the first people who, who have the term making money. Mm. Americans don't redistribute money. They make it. They create it, right? Yeah. And so Americans associate wealth with the creation of wealth, with somebody doing something productive, with somebody doing something that actually has, been, uh, has benefited other people because the only way to make money is to create a value that other people want and are willing to pay for. So everybody benefits when you make money. And that's the appropriate response to money making. But that's a very American response and a very anti-European response. So Europeans still have this envy because they associate wealth with aristocracy mm. and, th and therefore with stealing. Americans associate wealth with creation, with production, with innovation, and therefore we still have a respect for money. And, and you see it today where in America we respect the guys in Silicon Valley because they're, we know that they're creating wealth. We can see them creating wealth. We use their products. We resent some of the older industries because they're in bed with government. They, they, some of their wealth creation comes from cronyism rather than from real wealth creation. Right? It's, it's redistribution again. It's thievery, and we don't like that. So it's still America's healthier than Europe in the way we approach wealth. Okay. And... Um uh, do, do you so you see? Do you see no uh, no truth in the, in the European attitude of, of uh, let's maybe frame it like this? Uh, talk about regulation. Yeah, I'm going to come to. I actually have some questions from my, my friends sent. That would, they would okay, like to good, ask. So, good. So they're going to be interesting. But I mean, in terms of regulation, uh, usually the the common justification for having regulations in in various businesses or various fields or industries is is uh, to um, sort of stop these quote unquote quasi illegal, quasi immoral uh, or acquisitions of of wealth. Is uh, do you think it's necessary? Do you see any role for that? Because it, I'm not saying necessarily yeah. human beings are evil by nature or that most people are evil, but there's this um, there's this factor of diffusion of responsibility. It's easy to be, uh, perhaps, as a theory, as a hypothesis, to be uh, not being aware of the consequences of what your business might be doing. It's not because of your moral, but it's because your human psyche doesn't respond morally or ethically. It doesn't it doesn't have the, the the response isn't there if you don't see it right next to you. Yeah, but but but. A government official has it, right? They they know exactly what's moral and what's right, and they can, they could figure it all out, right? I mean, it's it's the whole assumption is a ridiculous assumption. Um, it's basically again saying that we need some experts, some philosopher kings who can figure out 
what the consequences of your actions is going to be, better than you and better than the marketplace. So right? you're not willing to admit that there's any role for this, that any kind of absolutely defense. zero. I would I would argue for zero regulations. That is, which clearly fraud is wrong, but we don't need new regulations in order to stop fraud. We've always had, uh, you know, laws against fraud, and yeah. and uh, and then. Uh, clearly, there are going to be new harms that people commit against one another because of technology, but the market's very good at discovering those harms, and the legal system is very good at taking care of them. But, but you know, the assumption is that if I don't have a government inspector inspect the elevators before when they're installed in this building, then elevators manufacturers are going to manufacture elevators that are going to kill people. No, right. yeah. Yeah. But that's just stupid. That's stupid. Yeah. Right? But th and think about how many mechanisms the market has created in order to make sure that elevators won't kill people, mm. right? You have to buy insurance. Insurance inspectors from insurance companies are going to inspect the elevators because they won't insure the elevators unless they've inspected yeah. them. The, the developer who's developing the building has a strong incentive that the elevators work because they're going to be liable if something happens. So they're going to inspect you as an in in yeah. elevator inspector. The ultimate tenant of the building, the people who actually live in the building, have a strong incentive. So they're going to want to see that there's some certification of proof that the elevator is a good elevator. Now, who do you trust more? The guy who works for an insurance company who is going to get fired if they do a bad job doing the inspection, or the guy who works for the government who never gets fired because he's got tenure, who's, who's making minimum wage or some low wage and therefore is much more open to bribery. So my view is that, that m there's much more corruption, much more opportunity for this idea of human um, diffusion or whatever you want to call it, like uh, not knowing what's right or what's yeah. wrong. Much more opportunities for that when the government has centralized power than there is when you diffuse the power throughout the economy, when you have multiple inspectors on the elevators because there are multiple people interested and when the inspectors need to do a good job, why? Because their job and their livelihood depend on doing the good job. Then uh, some inspector is doing it for the common good because he's a good altruist. I don't trust a good altruist. I mean, when I see a good altruist, I run for the hills. <laughs> it's scared. I'm yeah. scared of people who tell me they're doing this for the common good and for the public interest. Because nobody knows what the common good is. Nobody knows what the public interest is. There's no way to know it. Because what is the public? It's a bunch of individuals. Yeah. What's good for the public? What's good for a bunch of individuals? But who knows what's good for individuals? Only the individual knows that. Right. Okay. And that's why we need to leave them free. Mm. to pursue their own good okay. and the only time the government intervenes is when I'm doing you harm or when I mm. threaten to do Step you harm right. that's the only yeah. time and as long as I'm not doing you harm so uh, the assumption that McDonald's would poison us McDonald's would poison us if, if, if we didn't have food inspectors is nuts it's, it's completely nonsense. insane there's two more examples in recently the Brazilian meat uh, uh, scandal where they bribed government inspectors well of course i mean you, they always bribe it's much easier to bribe a government inspector right. than a private inspector right. and look are they going to be immoral people absolutely mm -hmm. are they going to be bad people yes yeah. and and to the extent that they do think that violate the rights of others they should be sent to jail for a long long time yeah. Does, does government regulation prevent that? No, I would argue the opposite. The more government regulates, the more incentive there is for poor people, for bad people to exist. Why? Because basically what government is telling the markets is don't worry, we got it. So don't think, don't, 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 re don't supervise, don't inspect, right? No buyer beware. Mm. Right, we've got it. We've yeah. taken care of it. So, for I'll give you an example from finance. Right, we have created a market in which um, the government has basically said we regulate every aspect of financial markets. So, when you buy stocks or bonds or whatever, don't worry. You know, we've got your back. Yeah. Nobody's going to commit fraud against you. You don't have to check these things out because because we've we the SEC has inspected everything. I don't think a Bernie Madoff. I don't know if you're familiar with Bernie yes. Madoff. Yeah, the big pyramid scheme yeah. guy. Yeah. I don't think he would have existed in a free market. I think the only reason Bernie Madoff existed is because of the complacency of the people who gave him money. Because they were assuming that because the SEC was there, because government was supervising everything, he was fine, right? And Indeed, if you look at Bernie Madoff, Bernie Madoff is a great case study to examine, right? Because Bernie Madoff uh, committed fraud on a massive scale, was never discovered by the regulators. How did they discover him? Because his kids told on him. His son 
told him. The SEC actually got a, a large report from a hedge fund manager, private hedge fund manager, mm-hmm. telling them why Bernie Madoff was a, was a pyramid scheme four years before they caught him. Mm. And they yeah, ignored him. Yeah. Right? So the private market saw the fraud well before the SEC did. And ima- imagine if the SEC was a private organization or if the job of the SEC was only one. Mm. That the SEC existed but it had only one job. To catch fraud. Yeah. Not to read my 13 G's and 13 D's and all the documents I have to file every time I, I buy stock and sell stock. Yeah. Because I own maybe more than 5% of particular stock. Mm. Not to follow around the, the law-abiding citizens and delve into every single little thing. Not to tell companies how to run their business or to tell board of directors how to become po- you know, what they should and shouldn't yeah. do. But instead of that, all they did was look out for fraud. Then they would have caught Bernie Madoff like that. But they're so busy trying to manage my life as an investor that they don't have time to catch fraudsters. Mm. So fraud is much more prevalent today than it would be in a free market. Much more prevalent today. Okay. But on another aspect, um, was it in a problem in the 21st century where a lot of businesses would dump their waste in the environment, in America particularly? So isn't that a... That's uh, funny that we say in America in particular. What, is, what do you think is the dirtiest place on the planet uh, uh, 30, 40 years ago. No, so let's I say the 1970s, 1980s. What was the dirtiest place on the planet? I, uh, I couldn't ask uh, that. Soviet Union? Yeah. yeah or the, the, the East, right? The yeah. Eastern Bloc. Eastern Germany was much more polluted yeah. than West Germany. No. Romania, uh, you know, Poland. Filthy, filthy, yeah. filthy, filthy. Why? Yeah. No. Because everything was public. Central planning. Uh, and everything was public. Right. So what do you take care of? Mm. You take care of your own stuff. So the way to solve the problem of pollution yeah. is to privatize everything. If you privatized all the land and all the rivers and all the lakes and the beachfront and even fishing rights like Iceland has done recently, yeah. then people start taking care of their stuff, right? So every, you can't pollute the river if it, I own it. Yeah. And if you own part of the river and I own part of the river, then we have to negotiate how the river is going to be used so that you don't pollute on your side and, and screw up my use of it downstream. Yeah. And there's long traditions in the old days when rivers were private uh, in, in the American West of, of how we dealt with those kind of situations. Yeah. Right? So capitalism is the way to clean the environment. Capitalism doesn't dirty the environment. No matter, the environment's always been dirty. Right? Why, why do Northern has Europeans... Been, has always been dirty? Yeah. It, it, it has m- more dirty since the industrial... No. Oh. No. I mean, it? well, in a I sense, but in a sense, no. We live in the cleanest environment in all of human history for human beings. Ta- why do you, why do you Northern that. Europeans drink beer? Do you know why, why you drink because beer so much? Because the water was so polluted back in the, the day. The water so was so polluted never, before never, human beings polluted yeah. the water. Just because nature pollutes, mm. that it wasn't good for human beings to drink water. Yeah. Why did Chinese drink tea? Because their water was so polluted, the tea guarantees that you boil the water. Yeah. So you had to boil the water before yeah. you drank it. And tea was a way to, to make sure that you did that. You, you know. So water's always been polluted. Today, do you have to boil the water? You don't have to drink beer. Today we drink beer because we like to, right? right? So we have a choice. Back then we didn't have a choice. Yep. So the fact is that for human beings right now, here we in the 21st century, the environment has never been cleaner. Uh, think about uh, the air, right? When we lived on farms where we cultivated, you had to yeah. grow the food that you ate. Do you think the air with all the horse manure and the, and the fertilizing garbage and everything else that was going, you think the air was clean? But yeah, but isn't that, that, but that in a mass scale? Yeah, no, doing. isn't that dis- disregarding the, uh, the fact that humans have uh, caused the, uh, I'm sorry, ima- global warming and that uh, in, uh, the coral reefs are disappearing? Yeah, we're doing that on a mass scale now. If, if you use the example as uh, well, but farm animals. But we're not. You, again, take, take the, so well, we we've got massive scale farm animals, yeah. and yet we're living more than double what we used to live, much more than double what we used to live, sure. right? Yeah. So, so life is pretty good, right? Oh, must, be, must be better. I agree, it's necessary for it to, uh, to uphold this. No, no, this but just, just think about human life. So if the standard yeah. is human life, not right. the planet, I don't know what the hell the planet means. Yeah, human life. But if the standard yeah. is human life, we used to live uh, at the end of the, of the, 17th, of the uh, 1700s, what was life expectancy? 50, no 40, 30 years, I don't know. 39. 
Yeah, okay. So I'd be dead, yeah. and you'd be middle aged. Yeah. Right. But isn't that also? You, we talked about statistics in the beginning. Isn't yeah. that? Isn't isn't that? Uh, isn't that just an average? Because mainly, sure. mainly people used to live until they were seventy. This is just a minor point, but people very people few people live into their seventies. But but it's also true that a lot of people died before the age of ten. Right. About fifty percent of children yeah. died. But why did they die? Mm. They died because of malnutrition, because of diseases, yeah. because of all these things. Yeah. So one of the and, and think how, how many people were around? How many people were on the planet in 1800? Less than a billion people. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think somewhere about 600 million. Right? Okay. How many people on the planet today? Eight billion people. Right. So there are more people. We live more than double the lifespan. Right. So why are we complaining about the environment? The environment has never been better. The air we breathe is 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 clean air. Yeah. The water we drink is clean water. Yeah. Okay. Let's yeah. assume. Let's assume the earth is warming. No. And uh, so what? So Finland will become easier to live in, right? I mean, Finland's terrible. It's so cold yeah. here. <laughs> so right, so, I agree, yeah, so you really short, worried about yeah. flooding in Florida? Y yeah. No, no, no. But oh, that's, sure. that's like wearing on a short scale. Let's say we escalate it more yeah. and more and more. Then at the end, it's all but there's desert. No, I, there's no science. Can I there's no this? science to suggest that, w that we're going to escalate it to such an extent of warmth that human life will not be possible. Plus, what you're ignoring is human ingenuity, human innovation, human ability to survive under very extreme conditions and because of our minds, yeah. and the, the ability of human beings to figure out ways to reduce global warming if it becomes a real threat. I don't believe it is a threat to human life. Even if it's happening, it's, I don't think it's a threat to human life. Uh, it might be a threat to certain people, yeah. and they move, but it, the Earth has been warmer than it is projected to be in the next 100 years yeah. in our past. Yeah. What worries me is the next ice age. Ice ages are much more dangerous to human beings than global warming is. And we know that the cycles of the Earth are going to yeah. bring about an yeah. ice age one day. What are we going to do in the glaciers in the Midwest of the United States and when everything around Finland is literally covered in ice? Mm. What then? How are we then going to survive? So you have to put global warming into perspective. And again, your generation has grown up believing in the – every generation grows up in believing that the end of the world is imminent. I mean, it's a part of human whatever. Yeah. We, we, we always believe that the world is going to end tomorrow. And, it, you know, my, maybe the generation before me believed that we were going to annihilate ourselves because of the Cold War nuclear w weapons. And then my generation believed that we're going to kill ourselves because of overpopulation and the chemicals in the air. And none of that ever yeah. happened, right? And now your generation believes that we're going to kill ourselves with global warming. It never happens. We're not going to kill ourselves. We're too smart to kill ourselves, right? Yeah, but it, we don't. We I'm don't have to kill ourselves uh, yeah, with global yeah. warming. But it, it can make life a lot more difficult. Let's say that sea level rises so a lot. And so the sea know. level rises, so people in Florida have to move. But at the same time, Canada and Finland become much more habitable and yeah, much more yeah, habitable. Yeah. So people move from Florida to Canada. Who cares? Why is this? Why is this becoming such an obsession with people? When you know, I, you know, in Netherlands has always been below sea level. No. And, and Amsterdam is a rich, thriving city. So if, if sea levels rise and Miami needs to build a wall out there into the sea to protect itself, who cares? So it'll cost a little bit of money. Much cheaper, by the way, than not using carbon fuels. I'd rather use carbon fuels and build a wall to prevent sea level rising. Right? So it, again, there's this human obsession with the end of the world. Mm -hmm. Get, it never, it doesn't happen, and it doesn't have to happen if if we're free to exercise our minds to figure out solutions. The solution can be, cannot be, to stop civilization, which is what not using carbon fuels would mean. Yeah, you can't replace carbon fuels. You can't replace them, even not today. Not today. Not today. But, not today, but do you think but it's, yeah. it would be a smart investment to uh, to prove on on? It? No, c carbon fuels are incredibly cheap. They're, they're, inc they're incredibly dense with energy. They're the best form of energy consumption today, except for one other form, which is nuclear. Yeah. But because of regulations, nuclear is so expensive, nobody wants to use it. But in nuclear is much safer than carbon fuels. Yeah. Much safer, even right. uh, fewer people have died from nuclear than have died from from uh, accidents yeah. at wind farms and yeah. it's uh, it, so. Nuclear is a solution, yeah. but we're so freaked out because of radioactivity or whatever that we won't invest in nuclear. But that's what we should be investing in is, is, is in nuclear energy. But then carbon fuels are so dense with energy that other than nuclear, they're the second best. Solar and wind are some of the most inefficient 
mechanisms to produce energy ever thought of. So uh, the technology would have to yeah. advance way ahead of where it is today to come anywhere close to the kind of uh, uh, energy density that the carbon fuels or the nuclear has. Yeah, but it's an energy that we can have forever, though. In a sense, if we can advance the solar technology, we can, can have that energy source forever. forever. Sorry, I uh, interrupted. No, no, it's Sorry. fine. Uh, can I frame this? Because uh, uh, dis- uh, sure. there's one uh, question related yeah. to this. Yeah, my friend Robin. Uh, uh, I'm going to just sort of read it verbatim. Currently, the amount of resources being used in the world are far from sustainable. I mean, the natural resources are being depleted far faster than they are being rege- regenerated. There's a strong correlation between resource use and rising standard of living. There's also a strong correlation between lowering resource use and government implemented taxes. Uh, for example, the c- currently relevant carbon tax and cap and trade programs. If government regulation of corporations is the enemy, how do you propose bringing resource utilization, utilization down to a sustainable level? I think the, the assumption is, is ridiculous. I don't think there's any depletion of resources going on. The amount of resources in the universe is unlimited from the perspective of human life. Um, the globe, which is this massive ball of resources, we've scraped barely, a, a f- a, a, a barely anything from this globe. The, the, you know, every time I hear, we've got, we've got peak oil. I've heard in my lifetime, at least four times we've yeah, reached yeah. peak oil. And then it turns out there's more oil reserves today in the world than in any points in human history. No. We're nowhere close to depleting resources. We have infinite, and by the time we get to the point where resources are being depleted, and if we allow human advancement and if we don't crush carbon fuels and everything else we'll be going to the asteroids and farming asteroids mining asteroids we haven't started mining the moon do you know how many resources in the moon i don't know nobody knows until we start mining it we won't find out what about mars right so there's no limit there's a wonderful there's the, one of my favorite economists ever was a guy named Julian Simon and everybody should study this guy and nobody does unfortunately and he wrote uh, two books called the ultimate resource and the ultimate resource 2 and in those books he shows that there's only one limited resource in the world and that is human ingenuity the human mind mm. because oil was in the ground and it wasn't it wasn't a resource. What was it? It was a. It was a. It was a. It was. It actually lowered the value of the land. If there was oil leaking no. in your land, it lowered the value, until some genius came around and figure out that you can turn that black, gooey, disgusting stuff into energy. Right? So that took a genius. That's a human mind. The planet is a ball of stuff. All is required is human ingenuity to turn that ball of stuff into whatever it is that we need. Mm. But there's no shortage of resources. The, the only shortage is imagination. And the thing that destroys ingenuity, the thing that destroys the human mind is force. So the more government regulates, the more government taxes, the more government uses force against us, the more government tells us wind is good and this is bad and that's bad, and it channels resources into what the, what the central planners believe is good, the less resources there are. But if we just left markets alone, what would happen? Well before we, we, we had oil depletion, what would happen? The price of oil would go You're studying economics, yeah. right? Yeah. The price of oil yeah. would go up. Yeah. What would that incentivize venture capitalists in Silicon Valley to do? Invest in something else. Look for yeah. something new. Look for something new. And we, we think the central planners in Washington, D.C. or in Helsinki or anywhere else yeah. know what the energy source of the future yeah. is or should be. They, you know, and the fact is that they're investing in, uh, in energy sources, wind and, and solar, that we know are far less efficient than oil and natural gas. Yeah. That the market would never invest in. Mm. And there's a reason it would never invest in. It doesn't make any sense to invest in those things. So the whole premise of the thing, and again, this is how you guys have been raised, that your generation is being uh, uh, indoctrinated, brainwashed with the ideology of environmentalism, which is, a, which is a horrible ideology, which tells you that there's limited resources on the planet, that man is a destructive force that's destroying the environment, as if there's any environment other than the human environment, which is the best it's ever been. I mean, think about how good human life is today. Yeah. It's unbelievable. You can get on a plane, as I did yesterday, and arrive in Helsinki, right? And, and on the plane, I had Wi-Fi. 
I could I could be connected to anybody on the planet while I was flying in a in a in a in an airplane that was using those evil carbon fuels. I mean, <laughs> this is we live in the greatest period in all of human history. We live the longest, the healthiest, That's absolutely true, the, yeah. the, the most prosperous, true, yeah. and yet you guys are supposed to be depressed because you're destroying the planet. No, you live. You know that you should be celebrating how wonderful yeah. capitalism is. That it's created. Hey, here we are sitting with microphones that are. You know, I have one of these mics in the U.S. because they're so good and they're so yeah. cool and they're everywhere. I mean, life is unbelievable. It's unbelievably good. And and stop worrying about the depletion of natural resources. That's a perspective of a central planner. Only platonic central planner philosopher kings worry about the depletion of resources. People like me say, eh, who cares? Right? Okay. Yeah. The market will take care of it. M people are smart enough to figure it out. Because you know what? Every example I can find where people suspected that a resource was being depleted, it turned out it wasn't. I you know, fracking. Yeah. Think about fracking. Fracking is this amazing way to extract more oil out of wells that we thought were depleted. Who would have imagined that? What yeah, central yeah. planner would have come out of that? Right? I remember when... Um, but hasn't fracking caused a lot of problems in the areas where fracking has been done? Yeah, the problems are minor as compared to the benefits. Yes, yeah, so it's caused a little bit of problems to pay the people whose, whose problems have been caused. But the problems are minor as compared to the fact that today the United States produces as much oil as Saudi Arabia does. Mm. Who cares about the little problems? Right? Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. I mean, I mean, so and and what are those problems? They, you know, they're yet to be clearly defined. But even if they were yeah. problems, okay, well, let's solve those problems. Let's find the problems and solve them, rather than saying, "Oh my God, we don't want new technology because it creates yeah. problems." Yeah. Right. In the abstraction. Yeah. What are the concrete problems? It's like global warming. If the warm, if the world is really warming up yeah. and sea levels are really rising, then let's think creatively about problems. For example, insurance companies. What would happen to insurance in if you lived in Florida? Insurance rates would go up, and it would be become very expensive expensive to own a home on the coast of Florida and people yeah. would start leaving well before the oceans would rise up yeah but you could al also just stop this by not using coal and going to nuclear and wha what would in a but what for are instance the and what are the yeah but, ag but again what are the costs yeah. of nuclear now let's assume now I'm all for going to nuclear yeah. the only thing that's preventing the market from going to nuclear is the unbelievable yeah, cost I of agree. regulation yeah. no, no, get rid of the regulation lower the regulation and let's get more nuclear power plants they're, they're wonderful new uh, nuclear reactors that are small incredibly efficient very safe yeah. let's build them all over the place i'm yeah. all for that but you know the fact is that even people who even people who um people who study global warming who b the, the 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 people who really think yeah. it's happening and it's happening think that it's too late already right so, but but okay, insurance uh, rates. Yeah. Go, but I'm saying even if sea rises, yeah. If if government didn't subsidize insurance, which it does in the United States on the coast, mm -hmm. right? Government subsidized people to live where the sea levels are going to rise if they rise, right? Yeah. So let's assume government did away with that, and there was private insurance markets. Then private insurance companies would say to you, "I'm not going to sell you insurance on, if you live on the coast. So what are you going to do? You're not going to live on the coast. You're going to move somewhere. So what?" But aren't the people mo most threatened? Uh, you have a you have a photo shoot, Sue. So we have to wrap this up oh, pretty soon. Yeah, you, when is it? <laughs> it's it's half past. So we have to like we're okay. ten minutes maybe. Okay. So um, uh, there's one more question I want to ask. But before that, then um, uh, isn't but aren't the people who who should be most concerned about this possible relocation that's going to happen if the sea levels rise, as they seem seems like they are? Uh, I doubt that they are. I mean, I I think they okay. stereo about global warming. We can make, we can like make a bet right now. I, I think they <laughs> just like they stereo around yeah. most of these environmental issues. Okay, is overblown. I'm not going to challenge whether the globe is warming or not. It's yeah. probably warming. It's warming at a much slower rate than the models predict, and sea levels are rising at a far slower pace than any of the models predict. And I I'm willing to put real money on the table now that by the end of your lives, which is a long yeah. time from now, uh, it, it, things will not be anywhere near as catastrophic as, as people are predicting today because these catastrophes, they never happen. They never happen because we exaggerate. This, is, this goes to Coleman's cognitive biases. We, one of the human cognitive biases that exists, and, and we can think about why it exists, but it exists, is we overplay the negatives. We always think the negatives true. are That's far true. bigger. And he talks about this, but it's true in environmentalism. We yeah. always think that, that we are destroying the planet. The planet. It's not going to happen. Okay. 
I'm not a scientist. But even I, if it's, <laughs> I'm, I'm yeah, not a scientist yeah. either. That's yeah. why I don't want to argue the science. Right. Yeah. I'm, but but exactly. I but I will argue the predictions. The predictions are overblown okay. because every prediction I've seen from the same scientist, the same, you know. Ehrlich, uh, who's, a, who's, a, who's a Stanford, uh, uh, I can't remember if it's a sociologist or what it is. He wrote a famous book in 1968 called The Population Bomb, yeah. right? And he predicted that hundreds of millions of people would die in the 1970s from starvation because there were too many people on the planet. It didn't happen. Mm. No. In the early 70s, he was one of the key people behind the idea that the Earth was cooling. Mm. The New York Times had a headline, the global cooling is happening, and it didn't happen. And he is one of the key people early on advocating for global warming. So when I see that, like I'm a finance guy, right? If you come to me and you want me to invest in your fund, what do I ask you first? What's your past performance? How have you done? Yeah. And if you've done poorly, I'm not going to give you any money. Mm. So I look at these environmentalists. Every prediction they've made has not turned out really well. But the, no, the, the, the but predictions about the, the, the Arctic... Arctic uh, yeah, but Antarctica, at the, at the southern end, the ice is expanding. So here it's shrinking and there it's expanding. I can't explain that. But, but my point is, and, and they can't predict the weather tomorrow. They can't predict the weather tomorrow. But they want to tell me they know what the weather is going to be in 10, 20 years? Because they're looking I, I, at correlations in, in, in long-term statistics. I'm very yeah. skeptical. Okay. I'm very skeptical. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong. No, of I'm just yeah. saying the given past performance... Yeah. I'm skeptical. If you look to, at the models, the models predict that the last 15 years would be unbelievably warm. And they haven't turned out. It's turned out to be well since 1998. No, they're warm on based on, 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 on observations on the Earth. But if you look at satellite, which is much more accurate, it, it's basically been flat since 1998. Okay, I, I haven't seen that research. I can't answer. Well, because, it, I mean, people like headlines that say warmest su warmest year ever. Yeah, yeah. But that's, but these are, they, they pick and choose the statistics they want to use. Yeah, all right, all right. That's interesting. Thanks for the honest perspective, though. I mean, it's uh, good to hear it. Yeah. Uh, but, but, the, but the point is, people panic. People overplay the negatives in, in almost everything. Yeah. And, and, and by the way, this is why, just to bring it up to politics of today, right? This is why somebody like Donald Trump can win, right? Because he goes out there, what does he say? He says, the world is ending. There's crime everywhere in the streets of America. It, crime is at the lowest rate it's been in 30 years. Or, you know, it peaked, it, it, it's, it went up a little bit yeah. last year. And but relative states, to the 1980s, yeah. it's very low. Uh, he says this, he talked about carnage in the streets of America. Carnage yeah. in the streets of America. I mean, it's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. And then he says if you travel around America, all you see is empty factories. We produce more stuff today in America than ever in human history. Double what we did in 1979 when peak uh, uh, production was. So in terms of stuff, we produce more. We, we do it with half the people. Why? Not because of the Chinese, because we have robots and computers yeah. who do the work. So the way Donald Trump won is by scaring people to death mm. yeah. and blaming foreigners and the elites for the problems. That's true. But, but he's playing on this, uh, on this pessimism yeah. that seems to be inherent somehow in, in this negativity that people have. And I'm saying all you have to do is look around the world and look around your environment and what you discover is that it's never been this good. It's, it, you know, and it, 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 one of the benefits of CO2 is there are more trees, it's greener. Uh, it, it, you know, yeah, so, so well, some coral reef is being yeah. destroyed. I mean, that's kind of sad if you like snorkeling yeah. and scuba diving. But you know what? My guess is that just as it's being destroyed there, it's probably being created because there are warmer seas somewhere else, and it's being created in unexpected places. Yeah, but we're cutting down the trees for farmlands and... Uh so but why are we cutting down trees for farmland? Because there's no private property rights. Mm. Where there's private property, there are more trees than there were before. Right? So if you look at the United States, just just no. I'm a, uh, just tell me what you really think, not what you think I'm going to yeah, tell yeah, okay, yeah. you. Do you think there are more trees today in the U.S. today or 100 years ago? 100 years ago? No, there were many more trees today than there are 100 years ago. Many more, not even close. Why? Because we're so efficient in growing food today that there's less farm land and the, fa the farmland that's disappeared has been replaced by forests. That's reason one. Second reason is there's money to be made, right? So if I cut down trees and sell you paper, yeah. what, do I do, what do I do after I cut down the trees? If I'm a, if I'm a greedy businessman. 
you <laughs> what do I do if I cut down the trees and I sell you the paper grow more yeah, yeah grow more because I'm greedy yeah. and I want to be able to sell you tomorrow yeah. trees as well so I so and, and not only that I think about how to increase the density of the trees mm. on my plot of yeah. land this is by the way why when you recycle paper you get less trees not more the more you recycle the fewer trees they're gonna be because you destroy the incentive to replant trees Instead of replanting trees for the future because demand for paper is going to shrink, I'm going to use the land for something else because my business is gone. Mm. This is pure economics 101. Just, just think about it for a minute. Uh, I I any, re any reusable resource, yeah. the more you use, the more you're going to have. So the, if, if we believe that consumption of trees is going to go up in the future, we would plant more trees. No. Basic business. Now, why are trees being destroyed in the Amazon? Because nobody owns the Amazon, and because we've we've taken people who don't own any land, and they are dirt poor, and what they do is they burn forest land, yeah. and they cultivate it for yeah. agriculture, and then the police come and they kick them off the land, and they go to another plot of land and they burn it and they design it for agriculture. If all of that land was owned privately, and given to those people. I'm all for land reform in Brazil and giving very poor people the land that they cultivate anyway. Yeah. And it's private ownership, then people would be Have much more responsible yeah, about how yeah, it's being okay. treated. So the solution to burning, but there's more, again, there's much more forest land. This is, you can, you can check this yeah, out. Yeah, I'm now making a much yeah, more forest yeah. land today in America. Yeah. And my guess is there's probably more forest land in, Sweet, in, in Finland today than there was in the past. Okay. okay. We've blasted through. <laughs> two hours almost. <laughs> but yeah. uh, one more question. I, this is I still have to give a talk. <laughs> <laughs> How's your throat feel? Is it good? It's fine. It's fine. I just need to think about what, what I have to say. I have no <laughs> what I've got left to say. I've right. said it all year. <laughs> I'm going to be shouting there. Heard it. Heard yeah, this. Go <laughs> on. All right. It's so the last question. Um, it's really kind of related to the first, uh, first one I brought up. Uh, the previous one, actually. Yeah. Uh, what is your take on... A potential post-scarcity economy, where the idea of selfishness is tempered by everybody having enough resources. Should we be heading towards this as fast as possible with technological advances, or will a lack of competition be bad for us? This is for my friend Jamie. Again, I, I don't completely understand the question because I don't believe, I mean, I don't, I don't buy the whole scarcity thing. Um, the only scarce resource is, again, ingenuity and imagination mm -hmm. and, and the use of reason. Um, we already, in a sense, live in a post-scarcity environment, right? There's enough food on the planet to feed everybody. There's a, the, a basic needs are all taken care of. Yeah, there's some problems in Africa, but y you could easily take care of that if you just gave them property rights and so on. Um, but human needs are unlimited. What we want is unlimited. Every time I think, oh, if I only made X number of money, I'd be happy. As soon as I make that money, yeah. I want more. Right? Which is cool because there's so many fun things in the world. You're never satisfied in the sense of experiencing enough things or having enough things. There's always more that you want and more than you need. Mm. So uh, human beings are always, that's always going to grow. So we, we live today in a world where we can imagine one day robots doing everything and we yeah. will just, it's nonsense. We will never just sit around because A, we, want, we need to work, we enjoy work, we value work, so we are going to continuously find things to do and find new products and new services and new th stuff to make. No, right. Why would competition disappear? Competition will only intensify. And again, competition is a function of freedom. The more freedom we have, the less government regulation, government control, government, even, even antitrust doesn't help. Uh, I don't believe in antitrust laws. I think they should be gone because the best thing for competition is free markets, is, is to l get government out of our lives. And in, in that sense, I don't believe competition will go away. Competition will only intensify. And the more the individual has the tools, like computers and other no. tools, to create and design and make more stuff, the more competition there is, then we become no. competitors on just about everything because we can do so much with the tools that, are being, that, that, that we have yeah. available to yeah. us. But all natural resources are products of the human mind. Mm. If you think about every natural resource, I mean, there was an Iron Age. Why was there an Iron Age? Because people suddenly discovered what to do with the stuff called iron. But how did they discover it? By using no. their mind, by figuring it out. So 
all natural resources uh, uh, are, are resources that are created by the human mind, discovered, if you will, by the human mind. And as long as we have a human mind and as long as that mind is left free to, to think and to innovate and to, 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 to discover new things, there's never going to be a shortage and there's never really going to be problems that we cannot overcome. Uh, so the, the bottom line is what you want is freedom. And the more freedom, the better. So, And this is why the regulatory state is bad, because it's the use of force. It's why the welfare state is bad, because it's the use of force. And force is the enemy of reason. Yeah. If I put a gun to the back of your head, thinking is out. And, and if that's the principle, force is the enemy of reason, what we want is to maximize reason, we get rid of force, all force, everywhere. I wish right. we could do this for 10 hours. There's so much more. <laughs> yeah. You might not. I might, might fall asleep in the meantime, but this, was, this yeah. has been fantastic. Good. It's very good. good. Well, very I've enjoyed good. it. This has been good. Yeah, and uh, uh, I'm looking forward to your lecture later. It's Thank you. Happening Thank you. In about Should be 30 fun. Minutes, so yeah. that's, that's <laughs> really Thank you so much for coming, Dr. Brooks. Pleasure. Thanks Thank for you. having me. Thank you. Thank you. All right.